everybody. Uh, never nice to be here. I've never been to Malaga before, but already loving the vibe. So I'm, I'm guessing that you might have heard the saying that everything is connected. You no, know maybe at some point in your life. And I don't want to say whether or not everything is connected, but I have noticed that connections really can be found everywhere from, you know, connections between people within languages and cultures and nature itself, and some being little connections while others connect us across time and others only exist for the meaning we as humans give them. And in these days when more data is being collected every day than we could ever hope to explore, the variety in connections being gathered is opening up the possibilities to visualize more of these often complex networks. And I've been into data visualization for a few years now, and I like to take on the bigger DSS, those that have a lot of diversity, so I can show context, the science of the May Day side. And ever since I started freelancing several years ago, I noticed that a lot of my projects can be seen as a revealing connection. Some eventually are regionalized as actual sort of the straightforward network for yours, but others need a different visual form to best display the inside. And during this call, I'd like to take you through some of my favorite connected projects to reveal the ugly truth that goes into creating these big and elaborate, often interactive visuals and stories. So I want to start out with straightforward connections. The litter of lines that are being drawn and only through those lines do the connections even exist. Constellation. So I'm officially an astronomer, so I have a read and big wires for anything space related. I get a lot of inspiration from space for the designs in my, my visuals, but I also find myself creating a visualization about space every now and then. And this was also the case for the Vitals project in a year-long collaboration that I did called Dave Sketches uh, together with Shirley Wu. And the idea was that every month we would create uh, an elaborate visualization from one specific topic. And the last one was about myths and libits, which through a whiny road of idea eventually led me to the concept of myths in the night sky. Because, you know, I can give points of my favorite constellations, but those were all from west of the culture. And I thought, you know, what are other cultures across space and time seeing in the say stars? Are there, you know, are there certain shapes that almost every culture identifies with? So I drew this tiny little sketch in my already I notebook, but in my mind, that was all I needed. And then I would look at these, you know, fabulous historic sky mounts that I would take from that that I liked. And so full of enthusiasm to get started. I, and then basically still had to crop my fears and hope that diverse cultural constellation data would be available online. Uh, I thought that was kind of, uh, or like small chance, but I quickly stumbled upon Stellarium, which is a great free planetary software, and even better, they are open source. So after some digging around in their GitHub, I found that they have constellation information available for more than 20 different cultures. You know, from the Western ones, but also with Chinese and Korean, Hawaiian, and at Asian, the Egyptian, and Mayan. So that was great, and some, you know, quick data preparation to get it ready for how I wanted to use it. And I always hate starting with, you know, an empty JavaScript file. And uh, so I, I usually try and find some sort of very simple serving point. And I looked up these simple star maps created with D3.js, which is my go-to library for creating data visualizations. And these examples were actually pretty straightforward. Not a lot of code. Uh, it, it's most of that is kind of taken into well, decrease geo functions take a lot of that stuff. So I thought this was one of these cases where I would take that little bit of code, paste it into my JavaScript file, quickly attach it to my data, and then people would work. Um, but of course, when I did that, all of my stars appeared in line. So, you know, too bad. Um, looking a little bit deeper, I found that I made a little mistake, and then the stars didn't appear all over my page. But having like consonants to play it, I didn't know if this was just a random scattering or it was actually correct. So I started adding things that I thought, well, this will add context, such as the background grid, and then also the constellation lies of Western culture. And then I immediately noticed Orion, which is my personal favorite constellation. I mean, you all have your favorite constellations, right? I don't know. This is white. Um, and so this is, in essence, a star map, but a very simple one, though. And so I started adding all kinds of things to, on the one hand, make it more in line with reality, so, you know, 
having the stars on the right sort of uh, give them a size according to how big they were, but also coloring them according to the color that they kind of shine in, but also remembering what I liked about those historic sky maps, like all of the embellishments with the zodiac signs and such. And I'll, I'll spare you the details, but this is basically kind of how I made my base sky map look. It's kind of setting up a really an elaborate chart area in a way. Because what would make my sky map different than the static was, was the inclusion of many different cultures at once. I would focus on one star, say Betelgeuse, and then I would visualize all of the constellations that use that one star. So I started by creating these little door charts around each of the stars that are used in at least one of these constellations, then kind of showing like how often are these stars used. And once I had that, I wanted to draw parallel lines between that one for each of the constellations. So the thicker the line, the more often that connection between those stars was actually being used. And again, in my little notebook, like, like that big, I started really like what I wanted to have, and then you're trying to use trigonometry to figure out how to make that work in terms of formulas, and I wasn't really getting there. And then suddenly, in the, in the red sort of circle, I remembered the normal lectures. That would be right say salvation, because during astronomy, I really like trigonometry and that kind of math, and I hated linear algebra, but at least I could remember the normal back to linear algebra. So that actually made it a lot easier. Um, so then these parable lines came back quite fast. And this is how sort of that final visual look for all of the constellations that used to star Beatrix. Uh, and when I first saw this, I really just loved that so many of these uh, cultures used that very similar sort of hourglass shape. But of course, each of these constellations sees something different in that shape, from objects to mythological creatures, to kings, to heroes, to just normal people in a way. Uh, and of course, there are always those that kind of defy the convention and do their own thing. This is one of my favorites. I hope you can see this kind of man that seems to be throwing something. I don't know. <laughs> I also love this one from the Egyptians, which is pretty a lot bigger than just the array that you have. Um, but yeah, so really fun to, to see in a way. And I also looked at some of the other stars, of course, uh, for example, Sirius, which is the brightest star in the night sky, but it actually doesn't have a whole lot of constellations. And I think that's because it's so bright and the stars around it are not. It just doesn't really have like a very easily recognized shape. I also still want to go to the other part of the earth to find this lovely deer shape somewhere, I hope. Uh, and what seems to be the shape that is most common across all the cultures in my data set was the one that most of us know as the Big Dipper. And I turned all of that into um, in this whole article that kind of explains that. It looks much more deeper of uh, different stars and different ways of looking at the same data set to kind of convey to people how, how people across time and space have seen connections in the night sky. And thankfully also, a lot of people that were interested in this, it seemed that it hadn't been done before. So that was also, I, I like the, all of the things that I can do in the digital, but then I also love if I can sometimes bring it into the physical. So that was for me all the reason to then turn them into sort of posters and then also be able to, to share it in that way. But I think when most people think about connections, they probably think about family ties. You know, how you are connected to your parents, your partner, your children. And for another one of the projects within that Dia Sketches collaboration, the topic was presidents and royalty. And I've always been intrigued by how into marriage the royals really are. You know, are they all cousins twice provoked? Or is it further than that or closer to some? And I wasn't just looking for the last few iterations in the main line of succession of one royal house so I could make it more traditional looking like this. No, I wanted as many connections as possible, crossing royal houses and going back as far as I can find it. And again, I was in luck because I found a data set of 3,000 people connected to all European royal houses going back more than a millennia on this amazing looking website. So one thing that all of the entire data sketches thing hobby over here is that website design really doesn't say anything about the quality of the data on its shares. It was from 1992, so I did have to spin an evening on Wikipedia and in order to more generations in the main line of succession, looking up some other famous royals. And what the, the problem that I have with these very highly interlinked networks of people or anything 
is that it's really hard to draw anything less abstract than just circles connected by lines. And that is because the best way to visualize a network connections is so inherent to the actual connections within the network. So what I do instead is I kind of just plot the data on my screen using the most basic settings in a way, and then continue to design from there, seeing how each of my sort of design choices affects the network until I'm finally seeing the insights. So I did that here as well, just plot the data on my screen, basic settings, and then this happened. An explosion of points moving out of my screen. Not very helpful. So I thought, well, I'll up it a little bit more gravity, maybe it come together a little bit, but that was kind of like a tipping point, and I immediately had a hairball. Not very helpful. Even when coloring everybody here at quite your birth. But at least the one thing that I have is that in my browser or on the web, I can play with the laws of gravity. Uh, so I cooled the web of course by year of birth, which was better, but it was still a rather uninsightful bundle. And at this point, I'd already invested several hours into playing with the network settings, trying different kinds of connections and adjusting my data. And I was really kind of ready to just give up and try a different angle, like how much of the oil spending these days, because that will make you cry. Um, and I gave him a last shot though. And that's when I decided to focus on the current royal years. So I spaced these out in a line and made them big. And then I let the vertical gravity depend on which of these royal leaders everybody was most closely related to. And that's when I finally saw it in science. For example, that the Queen of Denmark and the late Queen of England and King of Norway are quite heavily interconnected, but that the Prince of Monaco line and Bounty, Nicked and just died, separated from Europe over 200 years ago. And uh, when I finally felt like I had found the visual form that tells a story, did I start thinking about the visual design? And like I said, as an astronomer, I'm biased by space, so networks offer mind be of constellations. So I turned everybody into like a little star in the nice sky. So here's final one where I broke you to the line degrees to better fit a screen and. Because I wanted people to sort of play with the connections and get a sense of how closely people were related, I added two types of interactions. So on the one hand, you could hover over anybody like uh, Pauline of Rittenberg and see how far six degrees of separation reaches into this web, which for this lady, she's actually connected to six girl oil leaders in only six steps. And Lisa Colbert, the grandmother of Europe, if you look at her Wikipedia page. Uh, and also, for example, if you click on anybody, so let's say the late queen, Elizabeth, and then here I think we have Sissy, and then you see the shortest path between these two. So these two are probably not that closely related, but something that I didn't know is that the Queen of England and the King of Norway are really quite close to me. And what it did show me also is that it may be sadly, but maybe it's a good, it is a good thing, is that in the last 100 years, all of the four lines really started separating after science finally convinced them that inbreeding is not a good thing. So I was connected to the Guardian US by a mutual friend. And through the Gates Foundation, they have an entire section on their website that focuses on homelessness in America. And they have been well, for one of the flagship pieces, they've been gathering data for over a year about how the homeless people were being bussed around the country. So they would basically, a shelter or city would give them a bus ticket, a single way bus ticket to go somewhere else. Um, and they went and said, you know, let people know this is happening. So they have the data, but they were looking for someone to bring the insights to life through visualizations. Because I knew that this was too big for me alone, I asked Shirley Wool, which I have my collaboration for, for the data sciences project as well, to become my partner. And with my data science background, I took the data cleaning and analysis on me. And of course, all of these cities and shelters had sent over PDF files and Excel files that CST found. All completely different, so that was a wedding fun to do, but the real fun hit in the shape of typos and state errors. Because to properly know where a homeless person was moving to, I heated an existing city. So I created a collection of fuzzy text matching techniques to try and figure out the actual city in case my exact match wasn't found. But I also spent quite some hours manually just looking on Google in cases where even my fuzzy matching wasn't able to kind of locate it. And, and that's how I learned that 
The U.S. should never have created four states for that starve the letters M.A. That would literally save the few hours of my life. And while well, after all of that cleaning was done, I had about 35,000 juries. And so the analysis began. And I, I made tons of simple plots, dissecting the data in different ways, looking for, you know, trends and patterns. What about age and gender? What about big versus small cities? What destination was most popular? What have you counted for distance? But simply visualizing all these thousands of journeys on a map would be an important piece of the story. But just plotting them all on a map, sorry, it's kind of hard to see, but that's the US, um, that just didn't look good at all. So I knew that needed a different visual styling. Well, partly due to luck and timing, everybody involved could be in the same room together for two days, during which we figured out the main story that we wanted to tell. And Shirley and I created the visualizations for each of the main sort of conclusions that the story had. And one of the ones that I would pick up, my main one, would be that map of the US. And I thought, well, instead of showing all of these journeys at once, I wanted it to be an animation where all of these little streamlets, every person with a little streamlet moving from the starting point to where they were actually going. And then over time, these circles would grow behind the cities to show how many of the holos had gone there. Well, back home, I started programming it, and of course, you start out very simple, so you know, and everything starts and ends at the same time, and I, I didn't really think about how that would look once I sort of refreshed my page, so I was kind of pointing to see all of these little USs growing into the bigger one. Then I gave everybody the same speed, again, not really thinking about how that would look, uh, but then I did, got these shockwaves so Polish people across the US, not a great metaphor. Uh, again, refining further and further. Um, I then had everything actually working across the idea of a timeline running from 2011 to 2018-ish. But I was a full, also kind of still thinking about those original arcs. Like, would the arcs work in some way? Because I like to, uh, I like to try tangents or explore and iterate um, just to see or tick off that, you know, maybe there's a, a better solution out there. So I started working with these arcs before so I didn't go right on the first try. But eventually, these arcs were actually flowing, but it was just too busy, didn't feel right for it all, maybe tiny sections of arcs. Uh, but then it appeared that some people were moving to Canada to get from A to B, so that's still... I knew that the, the arcs were just a, a no-go. And I went back to the streamlets, and I tried all kinds of different small things, like being able to follow first for a little while. But we eventually just decided that if all of these people moving is already enough for this visualization. You don't have to add them more and more and more. So to show you the final result, they don't allow art for me, so let's see. <laughs> Got that correctly. So this is the full art and call, and here we have that map. And what you're seeing here, in case you haven't heard of it before, but this is called Scrolly Telly, where the map stays in place, the visual stays in place, and the, the text scrolls over it, and it adjusts to what the text shows, so the text and the visual are in sync. And we should be getting up to the animation now. Here we go. So the idea of this animation, though, really was to give people this thing. So how many homeless people will be in bus around the country and to all the different places they would actually go. But there are so many more visualizations in this entire story, as well as visuals and photos and videos to really try and find a, a proper balance between the personal stories, because these are real people that we're talking about, but also being able to show the high level insights that this rich data set gave us. So now I want to talk about the connections that can be drawn between our cultures. So since 2003, UNESCO has been gathering and safeguarding an ever-growing list of intangible cultural heritage, which could be anything from practices, knowledge, and skills that people see and being part of their cultural heritage. And about 40 new elements get added to this list each year, and you can browse the entire list uh, on the UNESCO website in the not so very inviting table. And if you click on it and get more information, such as videos and photos, but there's something else here as well on the lower left, which is very marked C, but they're called concepts. And then these are basically tags. So experts of these cultural elements have extensively tagged each of them. For example, here we have religious practice, costumes, dance, food preparation, and so on. And then if you look at all of these tags and compare them, it's no surprise that you know, several of these, these traditions, these cultural elements, have 
tags that they share, like vocal music being a part of all of these except for one. And one man within UNESCO had this vision where people would truly be able to see and interact with these connections to, to kind of get a sense that, you know, cultural elements from across different sides of the planet could be very similar because they had a lot of these similar tags. And thankfully, he had convinced management to give him some funding. He hired someone for the back end, and he reached out to me to ask me about the visual side. Well, he was very upfront in his first email about the scope of this network. At the time, there were about 450 elements, cultural elements and countries, world heritage sites, and about a thousand different concepts or a thousand different tags. And together, that is about 2,000 nodes, which is more of the technical term, or it means entities and networks. And between them, they shared a whopping 12,000 connections. And I have to admit that I, I really wasn't sure if I was ever going to be able to be able to figure that out because the royalty network that I showed you before, it may have had 3,000 people, but it had only four and a half thousand connections. And that already proved an impossibility for me. But I just, I mean, I don't know about you, but I just really did not want to say no to UNESCO as like a single freelancer. So it was just like, sure, and then my future self will figure it out. And as with the royalty network, uh, again, no use in sketching anything beforehand because it was just a too complicated network. So I plot everything on the page and then continue to design from there. And as bloodly expected, I ended up with hair balls. Giant, infectious looking diseases kept appearing on my screen no matter what I tried. Um, but there was thankfully one thing that saved me. Not all of these connections were of equal importance. Remember those concepts that I talked about? Well, there are primary and secondary concepts. So tango has dance, instrumental music, and vocal music as the primary ones, but it's a lot more secondary ones than just choreography and emotions. And although UNESCO did not allow me to aggravate any of these connections away, they were okay with me just focusing on only the primary connections to find a way to place everything on the page in a way. So I temporarily filtered out anything that wasn't a cultural element or a primary connection. I redid my network and then I finally saw this, which looked, you know, compared to those hair balls, a lot better. So I read against yellow here are the cultural elements and the concepts are almost too small to see and all of these kind of smaller things that you kind of want them to be sort of, I wanted their cultural elements to have as much spaces to move around as they wanted. But I was starting to see sort of communities in this space, like groups that seem to be closely linked together. And I thought that would be a great way to untangle this web one step further. Because in the airport analysis, you talk about communities, if groups of nodes are more highly interlinked together than they are the rest of the network. And four people have made our level staff can sort of detect these communities, uh, use that to then give each of them a different color. So I applied that to this, this particular network as well, just the you know, basic rainbow color scheme. And I was definitely seeing the communities here. I know it's a bit difficult to see, but we have like a lighter purple here and then a dark purple here and then this green latch over here. So this was definitely a good, a good thing. And so now I also made, uh, I also made these concepts bigger. So the more, uh, the more connections, like the more cultural elements that have this certain concept, like vocal music, the bigger the circle gets. It kind of creates also that visual diversity. This is our order progress screenshot. So it kind of messy, but that's kind of the uh, how it's looking. And I thought, well, actually, you know, a typically a network algorithm just plops all of the data on the screen randomly and then lets everything figure it out. But I felt that I know which ones should be, you know, should belong together because I, I've done this community find the algorithm. So instead, I want everything to start like in a circle Every, every, everything starting from that sort of community center. And then I would let the network algorithm do its thing. And when I saw this, I was really sort of happily surprised because all of these, most of these circles stay really close to that initial starting point. They really kind of only move away because I don't want them to overlap, but only a few of them get drawn towards different areas within the network. They have more ambiguous connections. So looking at this particular network from the angle of communities was apparently the way to go. And I'm sorry that you can't actually see. There are gray lines from here as well that show the connections between the circles. That's sadly, that's, I made them too like gray. 
Well, then I plugged in everything that I filtered out, placed them on like an average location, and then did a second network algorithm that would kind of draw anything uh, again based on everything they were connected to. And then by now it was tied to move to a different color color and give everybody like the concepts, the network, the cultural elements, the, the regions, the countries, their own kind of shape and color aesthetic. And I really liked how if I zoomed in, it kind of reminded me of like outer space. And my client, with me not saying anything about this, um, this he started calling this visualization the constellation, which of course I did not that news. So with the surface cleared out, it was time to look at the lines, how to visualize 12,000 lines on the page. Well, I, you know, I think the gray straight's kind of boring, so I just made them all colored and, and, and curved. But you know, 12,000 lines of full opacity makes no sense. So again, I had to kind of iterate here um, and, you know, you, thinking about how this primary and secondary connections, of course, I didn't go right in the first try, but um, thinking about the primary and secondary ones, I thought, well, you know, if, if I hover over any circle, I will show all of its connection. And the primary ones are thick, and the secondary ones are then thin. And then if you don't hover over anything, I will really only show you the primary connections, the important ones. But that was really only the tip of the iceberg, because the client also wanted it that if you had, if you hovered over a region, it should show all the countries and that all the cultural elements connected to that. If you had to be able to send a query to the visual, which would then fix everything in the query, um, you had to be able to, if you clicked on one circle and fixed it, you still had to be able to hover over all of the other circles and get information. You had to be able to pan around and zoom in. If you zoom in far enough, you would have to show the photos of all the cultural elements. And then if you click something, you still have to somehow be able to click somewhere else to get a pop-up window and to get more information and then this play at the house. This, this started out as a simple interactive and turned into the, the biggest interactive I've ever made, which kills build and of it. Like it's built on like a fundament that wasn't meant to be that interactive. No, I'll leave it at that. So this is a visual and uh, you can go in there and like click on any of these cultural elements uh, and then you can see what they're connected to. So this must connect to multi-ethnic societies and we have sacrifice, cattle, very specific, the moon, I like that one. Uh, well, there's the moon so we can see now what everything is connected to the moon. Well, we have another cultural element here that's connected to the moon, which is about woodworking and technical skills and sailing. And that's kind of how this visual tries and make it kind of to let you explore it is kind of randomly click around and get a feeling for all of these things and how in a way everything is connected and this was a very fun project to do eventually though um because i really enjoyed how open unesco was to me trying different ways to get a handle on this network and that we had eventually found a way so now i want to look at connections between uh in their language, if you look at sentences and similarities within language sentences. So, oh boy. That, sorry, blood and mortar. Um, so, before COVID, Google News Lab would ask data visualizers to create sort of database driven articles and explorations based on Google data. And I had the fortune to create one for them already, and I was really happy when they reached out to ask me to do another one. And sorry, I came up with a bunch of ideas, but there was one that really stood out to me and my contacts at Google, doing something about pets. So having these two people of thought balls in my house with half a months, they're a bit bigger now. Um, uh, but I found myself on Google quite often, especially these last few months, Googling, you know, and is this okay? Is this normal? Or just, you know, how do I do this? How do I do that? And I was doing curious how people in general, you know, how do they use Google to better understand their pets? So what I wanted to get was a view set of the most popular questions that ask why about cats and dogs. So, you know, why new cats? Why does a cat? Why does my cat? And a few more of variations. And then the same for dogs. And look at similarities and trends and patterns and so on. And then during the sketch, uh, and this is really the sketch, this my sketch level, um, that I sent to clients, really rough. And my main this sort of idea would be this sentence tree, where I would break apart all of the other sentences into their words and kind of build them back up again, bringing everything together that was similar. 
Let me try and explain that one step further up. Um, here we have 2,000 of the most important questions that people ask about their cats. And then I say, well, you know, it could be everything that starts with the word like. So why do cats like? Well, I could be a short list, but within this, there are actually three sentences that have the word boxes as the second word. So why do cats like boxes? So I can combine that one step further. And the same is true for other parts of these sentences. And if I do all of them, I can create this sentence tree where, again, sorry, you cannot see the lines. I, I guess I like line gray too much. But you can rebuild up um, a sentence by following the line from left to right. So you would have, you know, why do cats like lining on the floor or on your chest? The way you can slide to go in the back from with you is a fun one. Yeah, I never, they never know why. Um, but then this is takes up a lot of space. So I thought, well, I actually want that to make that smaller. I want uh, all these circles to scale based on their popularity. So why do cats like boxes? It's very popular. Why do cats like shoes is much less popular but this is only one sort of small part of the full data set and i wanted to do this for all 2000 questions at once and i started out with like very simple network again the same idea trying to draw the lines and make it appear of like how these sentences were connected but i also wanted i had to increase the circles because to make this visual more interesting to look at i had to put as many of the words inside of the circles so it would be easy to read like what each circle represented. But by now, the circles have to become, well, they have become so big that it was impossible to tell which circle was the parent and which circles were the children. They were kind of these gray blurbers going outward. And from that moment, I tried, I don't know how many things to make this clear. Who is the parent, who is the child? Like grouping every child of the same parent, like I did here, but then it was still was unclear who the parent was. And I was in terms of how this crazy thing where, very slowly, my circles just started rotating faster and faster. And the only solution that I could buy, I think it was just some strange sort of imbalance of the surface in some way combined with the network algorithm, because I, the only thing that I could do was undo in my code and then to lift up the rear. I would draw ideas, like mirror ideas that I had in my notebook to see if it kind of made sense spend some hours trying to program it, like here where I put every, all the children in this sort of an overarching circle, but it just, it didn't, it didn't look inviting in way. It didn't really feel like people would want to investigate this visual or, and we have chaos from that one then. Uh, and I, like, I tried with so many different things on try see if I could make this visual just look interesting. In the end, I even made it possible where I could drag all in circles myself to see how I know if I were to place them, how would I place them? I took about two hours to do just this right hand side, and I, I found to just step back and thought, no, no, this is still not making it inviting in my eyes for people that want to actually, you know, go into this data set. So this was 40 hours after starting that very first network, they finally gave up. But it was a PA client, um, so I needed to visualize this somehow. And what I typically do though, I mean, I, I have this more often, although it usually does to be 40 hours to finally give up on like the course that I had. But I thought like looking back on everything that I've tried across all those 40 hours, is there anything now that I've given up on this sort of me idea of wanting to have this one scent in a tree, a branch it out in the center, if I, if I just pluck, you know, throw that away, is there anything that I think I try and that seems like it would be a good other tangent to go into. And in this case, I had to think about this idea where I had to cut all of the connections to that central circle so that each branch would become its own mini treat. Like we have uh, like over here, which you've already seen, but there's also lick and meow and mead. Of course, that didn't go right on first try. Uh, but I remember thinking that all well, the mini treat actually do look a lot more interesting and fun to investigate. And then maybe I could sort of make every one of those mini trees lie inside of a bigger circle and all these circles together. So what I did was, oh man. So there are a bunch of white circles with very, you know, subtle um, gray drop shadows on this page. Please believe me. Um, so these circles that you are not seeing that are blocking some of the first light, the, the, the pink point. Um, 
they have like they can tell you this. I wish I could tell you. But you know, there's, there's stuff happening now, all these white circles that you can't see are moving around, kind of pushing the others away. So there's like the very nice, you know, group of sort of therapy. <laughs> and never then each of these invisible circles, um, I would then run a separate network algorithm for each of these mini trees. These that we see can see. Uh, and of course, um, I'm actually using web workers for this because, you know, running like a hundred plus um, network algorithms takes a bit of toll and I really didn't need it to be animated, so web workers to the rescue. And that's where all the others appear from. And when I saw this, I quietly felt like I'd figured it out. I mean, it's totally biased after 40 hours of failure, um, but I finally felt like I had found a way to visualize all of the data, like all 2,000 questions in some way that would not make it too overwhelming, too scary to want to play with, especially if I then looked into the design aspect. And I made it very whimsical and colorful and playful, really trying to invite people to want to move their mouse over this page and just see what it had to say. They're like, you know, why does, why do cats have a rough tongue or stinky breath? <laughs> why do they stare out the windows? And there are lots of fun ones in here. Some very stat ones, like why does my cat bite me or only me? It's very sad. And then, of course, this wasn't the only visual that on that particular page, so I had to start the whole process again for other visuals. I tried, I don't know how many color colors he fonts, and, and I had to create sort of a layout for the entire page to write the article, and I had to have different kinds of charts and interactions on mobile versus desktop. You know, from a personal point of view, I'm really happy that we have smartphones, but from a professional point of view, I'm really not happy that we have smartphones as a data visualization designer, because the screen is just so small to make real things. Having to make like an interactive sort of search box and whatnot. So let me just kind of take you quick, let me take you through what became the final result. So we have cats and dogs, and I love both, but yeah, I have cats, so I'm going for cats, you know. So I tried to make it first very, uh, kind of sort of ease people into this. So something very simple, just, you know, circles within circles, like when your pests are afraid of cucumbers, it was a meme a few years before, so that was big. I, I know how they, the sounds they make and the licking and the biting that they do and the sleeping that they do. And then once I sort of ease people into that, I kind of show them, well, here's everything. Do you want to search for something? But you can also look at that data set in so many different ways. So I'd, I think my favorite one, which was the difference, the sole difference between questions that people ask about my cat versus a cat, which is interesting, like drooling and sneezing and throwing up and smelling are things that are very high up in the my pet questions, but don't even appear in the top of a cat questions, which makes sense. And then of course, cats versus dogs. Another, uh, this is the biggest project I've ever worked on, uh, and it was also a lot of the funnest though, because it's, I just really, the data set was just uh, a real joke. But it doesn't really stop there because you can find connections in the way or, you know, if a, a, a business is organized. You can find different kinds of connections between people besides family, like lovers or friends. You can find connections between the way systems work, like services, calling other services, calling other services. And, and, and connections across time, such as, you know, how uh, the order of the fights of the characters of variable Z, like how they fought together. And I hope that I've been able to show you how amazingly different connections can be and how they can be everywhere. I've really come to learn how working with these connections really requires a very custom and iterative and creative approach. You know, sometimes connections can be a straightforward thing. You can draw out I mean, something like a design beforehand, like with the constellations, but more often than not, the, the connections are just too complex and elusive and the only thing that I can do is just put all the data on the screen and then continue with the design with code so I can see exactly how each of my design choices sort of transforms the connections until I'm finally seeing inside. Well, you can find all of these projects and several more that I didn't have time to show you on my website. Uh, I'm on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, if you really love follow me, I suggest signing up to my newsletter because it's basically giving you misannouncements on social media these days. Um, and finally, Thank you very much for your attention. Okay.